nanohub.org. Online simulation and more for nanotechnology. So Dr. Nanyao is one of my colleagues here at, uh, at Princeton University. He's a, academically a senior research scholar with rank of full professor with continuous appointment. And he's also the director of our Imaging Analysis Center here at Princeton University. And he plays with a lot of those really cool uh, electron microscopes I was showing you in the beginning. Uh, Nan is uh, you know, a PhD from Arizona State University. He was a postdoctoral fellow at uh, Exxon Mobil and also visiting scientists at Shell, joined Princeton University in 1993 and basically has been, from 1999 to present, has been the director of the Imaging Analysis Center and received his academic appointment as a uh, research prof- scholar at, in 2003. He's a fellow of the Microscopy Society of America, the Royal Microscopical Society of the United Kingdom and a fellow of the American Association for the Advancements of Scientists. He's 10-time recipient of the Princeton Teaching Award. Um, I've only gotten one of those, so I'm very jealous of Nan, but I haven't been here as long. Um, And he's educated over 4,000 students and 800 industrial scientists from 120 different uh, companies. And Nan has a lot of fun with Microsoft. I just have to mention this. So in 2009, he was part of the team that co-discoverer of the first natural quasi-crystal in 2009. And that was from a 4.5 billion year old meteorite. And that work was actually cited and mentioned when they announced the 2011 Nobel Prize. Um, He discovered a 650 million year old fossil, um, basically pushing our understanding of the first animals that were here on earth back 100 million years than we previously thought they were. He did that in 2010. Uh, He had some really fun finding and identifying the earliest known human use of diamonds in 4000 BC in a a paper that was published in 2005. So I can think of no better person to talk about the many different uses that we can find for transmission electron microscopy than Dr. Nanyo. All right. Um, Thank you, Jim, um, for a very kind introduction. And uh, thank you, Glenn and, and Jim, uh, to provide me this opportunity uh, to talk to you, uh, this audience. Um, I try to um, provide fundamentals of the transmission electron microscopy. Uh, I try to provide some uh, basic information about transmission electron microscope and um, the development of it. Um, how we best can utilize them. There are so many things uh, within a 30 minutes, it's very difficult to cover them all, but okay. I, will, I will try my best. Okay, here we go. So we're talking about the microscopy. Um, I believe um, this is a, a common knowledge nowadays, but it would be nice to remind us microscopy, basically the eyes and the hands for modern science and specifically for nanotechnology, because everything you are trying to uh, do, you try to solve the problem, but the first thing would be better you see it, right? Then identify the issue. So with the development of uh, um, microscopy uh, over the last almost 400 years, nowadays we reach to the arrow, we can do atom by atom engineering. Basically you can manipulate atoms to build uh, smallest uh, device uh, you can. So that's why uh, the electron microscopy uh, is so important and is an indispensable tool um, to conduct our research uh, in material science. Every time when I give a talk, I cannot uh, um, help to show you this layout of our uh, imaging and uh, analysis center at Princeton. Uh, We basically start from one electron microscope, one person uh, to today's with uh, over 400 million assets. And you can see the list of the microscopes we have. As Jim and uh, Glenn mentioned, um, we have FIB, we have TEM, we have SEM, um, we even have two cryo high-end transmission electron microscopes. So if you are interested to learn more, uh, you're welcome to visit our website, which is uh, listed here on the bottom right is the address. Talking about transmission electron microscopy, uh, it would be nice to give a brief history of that. So actually, uh, this was uh, developed in early 1930s. And at that time, a young student named Ernst Ruska 
from Berlin Technology Institute and working with his PhD advisor, uh, built the first transmission electron microscope. That is a um, historical picture showing number four here. Uh, we always try to test students, guess who is um, Ernst Ruska, who is a student, uh, who is Michael Connell. And most of people can guess it right because students normally do the job and advisor uh, stand behind. So the one on the right is Ernst Ruska. 50 years of, uh, later, and Ernst Ruska got a Nobel Prize for his um, contribution to develop the first transmission electron microscope. Uh, Michael Connell, unfortunately, uh, was not there anymore. So it's good you, you can wait longer enough to see the outcome. Um, number six here uh, basically is, uh, I also want to share, uh, probably many of you um, have a long history doing research, doing science, heard about carbon nanotubes. That's basically the beginning of, of nanotechnology, right, in early 1990s. That was developed, uh, first discovered by this gentleman sitting here uh, in figure six, Sumio Ijima. And he was a postdoc when I was a graduate student back to Arizona State. And he is one of genius. And he can see things nobody else can see using the same microscope. Uh, that's why he got the discovery of that. And John Colley Stein, uh, stand be behind him is my advisor. He basically considered as a godfather in electron microscopy, especially transmission electron microscopy. And he uh, really nurtured a lot of students, uh, several generations of uh, modern uh, scientists uh, from his, his uh, uh, mentoring. Number seven uh, is a Nobel Prize win uh, winner of uh, uh, Dan Shukman. He discovered a nature quasi uh, no, synthetic quasi crystal, got a Nobel Prize. 2011. As Jim mentioned, at Princeton, we discovered the second phase of that, which is nature quasi crystal. And in the past, minerals and other crystals, um, you don't have the third form. You only have, have crystal line or non crystal line. Since our work now, nature uh, material, solid has a third form, we call the nature quasi crystal. So TEM really make a huge contribution uh, to the development uh, of uh, our science technology. Uh, the latest Nobel Prize was awarded 2017 for development of cryo EM. And uh, you have heard a little bit about that, which is extremely important to study biological materials. And if you look at uh, top journals nowadays, science nature, almost every issue has a paper using cryo uh, EM. So that's basic history. When we talk about uh, electron microscopy, we always ask us and what we can learn and how the system work. Uh, I want to share this diagram with you and which is basically can extend to any technique you use to study your materials. Basically you have an incident uh, probe, can be light, can be electron beam, can be ions, can be x-rays. So interact with your sample. And then through this interaction, you generate all kinds of signals. And the signal include electron can uh, elastically bounce the back, right? Like a backscatter electrons from the en same entry surface. You also can generate secondary electrons, Roger electrons, and characteristic X-rays. Each signal can give you unique information about your sample. For instance, we probably already very familiar with SEM. Using, using secondary electrons, we can study the morphology of the material. Backscatter electrons, we can study orientation of the materials. Characteristic X-rays can tell us what kind of elements inside your sample from the region uh, your probe is. And we also can do another half. If incident beam energy is high enough, sample is thin enough, all the signal can penetrate through the sample. That is the foundation of the transmission uh, microscopy, right? For TEM, you're using electrons, so electron transmitted through the sample, 
get all kinds of signals after the sample. So that's the base of transmission electron microscopy. That's what we try to cover uh, in, in this short uh, presentation. So if we use a secondary electrons using these electrons, uh, this uh, give us a surface morphology, right? You basically cannot see through the sample, but the morphology of the sample um, give you very nice uh, information. For instance, this is one of the early pictures I have. Look at the diatoms. And uh, if you don't look at the scale bar here, you basically think this is a piece of art. Uh, actually, nature created that. And there's a full story behind it, why nature can create such a sophisticated structure. Our human being is way behind. We have no way to, uh, to, to synthesize this complicated structure. But how about we look at the things through the sample? And here's a typical transmission electron uh, imaging. And at a very high scale, uh, we can see here the scale bar is five nanometers. And this is a small platinum particle. And we, shoot, we see through it. Each bright spot here represent a column of atoms viewing from our eye into the screen. And this gives us a lot of information, right? Uh, what we can see here, crystal orientation, what kind of lattice we have. We also can see the defects. Look at the, uh, this dark band uh, here running from left bottom to the right top. And this is a, a cleaning structure. Because the orientation is different, it block a certain portion of electrons. That's why it appear dark. And as uh, Jim mentioned earlier, this so-called bright field image. And also on the edge of this, even particle appear very shining, but through the TEM, only from the TEM, you can see there's a layer of amorphous on the outside of this circle. So about two nanometers thick, this is a uh, oxide uh, exists, which is extremely important to know this, especially when you study small particles, catalyst particles, that can affect all kinds of chemical uh, properties. How can we achieve those pictures, uh, images? We use transmission electron microscope. So those are microscopes actually I used as a graduate student uh, back in 1980s. Uh, you can see here, um, it's not that shining anymore, but if you open the column up, you can see inside. It's all piece of metals, right? And this is so-called uh, transmission electron microscopy, uh, microscope. It's a 100 kilovolt. That means instant electron and uh, shoot through the column Hit your sample with an energy of 100 uh, kilovolt. And the other type is called a, a stem. Uh, actually, when people talk about stem these days, um, we are very familiar with this name um, many, many years ago because this is called a scanning transmission electron microscope. So the beam not only transmitted through the beam uh, sample, but also scan. So that's why we use this stem uh, technology. And uh, go back to uh, development of electron microscopy. We have to um, give the credit, as I mentioned earlier, and Ernst Ruska. So it's about 40 years after the discovery of JJ, uh, electrons by J.J. Thomas, Thomas from Cavendish lab uh, in UK, and he built the first one. And Michael Connell actually credit, was credited for building the first scanning electron microscope. And his advisor said, well, we can do the same thing, but we focus the beam, control uh, the beam, let it scan. Uh, we can form the scanning electron microscope. So the continued development over the last eight decades, decades um, make electron microscope uh, a very powerful tool, right? Uh, here is a slide, and um, I really enjoy uh, because it shows Ernst Muska. Um, got a Nobel Prize, and this is uh, a prize photo. Um, but more important is a statement he made. He said the light microscope opened the first gate to the microcosm. The electron microscope opened the second because you have much better resolution, right? Shorter wavelengths. And he already asked the question for next one or two generation scientists. 
what will we find opening the third gate? So far, there's no clue, right? Can we see something smaller than inside the atom? Can we see anything inside the electron? We don't know. Nobody knows. <laughs> but that's a really good question, right? And make uh, our people, our students, uh, to think about it, right? So here's uh, uh, another picture, um, just enlarge the one I showed earlier, Ernst Ruska and uh, Michael Knoll. This is the first uh, transmission electron marks. Go look at those cables here and so on and so forth. And nowadays, um, what is the status of transmission electron microscope? And that's the one of the scope we have uh, at the Princeton. With this microscope, we basically can see dense of single gold atoms. So I call it single and group dance performed by gold atoms. Each bright spice, uh, spots here on the right picture is a single gold atom under electron observation in the real time. And the cluster of that and it is a group of uh, gold atoms. So we did some imaging simulation uh, measuring the distance between gold in this form. They are much larger than the distance uh, in the uh, standard crystal spacing. So that is try to understand what is the maximum distance between two atoms before they fall apart. And those kind of information uh, could be interest for us uh, to know through this high powerful technique. Now let's talk about transmission electron microscope. And we always want to connect the new thing with stuff we already know. What we are familiar with uh, through the very beginning is optical microscope, which on the left of this slide, uh, you can see here uh, there are major components. You have sample, you have a light source, right? You have a lens, right? And the lens before the sample, between sample and uh, light source, we normally call the condenser lens. And some microscope, you have another set of lens between your sample and your eye, and that's called the objective lens, right? We use, UT, uh, we use this terminology through all different microscopes, light microscope, ion microscope, x-ray microscope, and the electron microscope. So with a similar design, and we look at the uh, um, scanning electron microscope here, right? Instead of visible light, we use an electron gun to emit electrons. And then we have a condenser lens, basic is a set of magnetic coil and to manipulate an electron beam. Uh, we know that electron is a charged particles and the magnetic field can change it through so-called Lorentz force. Uh, we'll give you a formula that try to refresh. And then heating on the sample, um, you create uh, secondary electrons, collect by this detector, and displayed on the uh, computer monitor. Uh, so this is a, a gun lens sample. How about the transmission electron microscope? Basically, transmission electron microscope utilizes uh, a SEM column, right? But different is 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 taller, and you also have a lenses below the sample, which SEM doesn't have, and to collect transmitted electrons and go through. Uh, column and heating on the screen, uh, you can observe it. So with this, we have a pretty clear idea how the electron microscope works compared with optical microscope. We use a similar terminology. Only difference here is we use electron instead of light. We use a magnetic field instead of glass lens, right, in, in the optical microscope. And when we deal with electron microscope, and we want to know, um, what is the key components, right? And if you open the microscope, there are thousands and thousands of small pieces. It's a very nice, uh, complicated uh, system. But we can divide them to a few components, which is critical. One is the electron gun, which is responsible to emit electrons, high density electrons, and uh, pure energy electrons, and small probe size of electrons. That's normally what we need. Then we have a lens, and how can we manipulate electrons, not distort them, and uh, not add artifacts. That's the beauty of lens. Among all the lenses, the most important one 
is the objective lens, the one right below the sample. And we worry about how strong they are and how small the aberration uh, coefficient is. Third one is the goniometer, which provide flexibility of your sample and the stability. And you can do all kinds of things, right, during the observation. That's where the in situ microscopy uh, come to the picture. So um, uh, besides all this, of course, we need a very good vacuum system. And for a high-end electron microscope, you want to sample surface as clean as possible, not contaminate by carbon monoxide or so, so on and so forth. You need a good vacuum. But we don't have time to talk about that. But just keeping in mind, most of transmission electron microscope has to be operated under high vacuum. High vacuum, uh, we mean normally uh, above 10 to minus 7 tau. Yeah. All right, now let's talk about electron gun. Uh, this is a simplified diagram showing how electron gun works. So you have a filament here, and which is a, a castle, and then you add anode, you add a voltage there, when you heat up the filament, the electron can be pulled out. Then you have an aperture here, and you control the size of the electron beam, and with the accelerator afterwards, you can control the energy of the electron beam. That is the electron gun uh, principle. For electron microscope, nowadays normally have a three different type of guns, right? And the one is called uh, tungsten gun, which is uh, uh, very cheap and um, um, you can get it easily, uh, but you need a high quality for that. That's lab six. But the most important one, all the modern electron microscope require fuel emission uh, gun. That give you much better and operation. Basically, people compare field emission gun uh, to the optical microscope, like uh, you use a regular light or laser light for your, for your microscope. So the field emission gun is so important. And um, it's actually developed by Albert Klu from the University of Chicago about 50 years ago. And he was basically in the short list of Nobel Prize along with my other advisor. But people consider his contribution is bigger because field emission gun is a, is a base for, for the modern uh, microscopy. So you can see that for gun, what we required is and uh, um, energy spread, right? Why we need the very short energy spread, just like a light, and you have a band of wavelengths, right? If the light goes through the uh, prism, and color will be uh, displayed. So that means you can disperse them. Uh, so you go through the same lens, um, different wavelengths will be banned differently. Uh, so that's why you need a uh, unique um, light like a laser, only one wavelength. Same for electrons. If all electrons have the same energy, they go through the magnetic field, they can be act with the same force. They can be banned at the same angle. But if you have the different energy, and then they just like have different wavelengths of light, and they will go through the prism. So that's not good. Uh, now we talk about the electron lens. And the electron lens basically is, is a bunch of magnetic field, right? And uh, how can we generate the magnetic field inside the microscope? How can we overcome the aberration? Aberration is more critical in electron microscopy than optical microscope. I always talk about that. And among the aberration we try to correct is most critical one is a spherical aberration and then chromatic aberration, uh, asphyxism. That is minor, only uh, important to deal with at a high mag magnification. So how the uh, magnetic lens work? Uh, we utilize uh, the principle of Lorentz force, right? So if we have a closed coil here, you shoot the electron in, and then uh, the current goes through the coil will affect this, right? If you have, if we refresh our uh, high school physics, if there's any change in electron current, then there's a field change. And if there's any f magnetic field change can generate a current change, right? So that's why, and people utilize this, this principle to build a device to manipulate electrons. 
And we can see the Laurent force here formula, right? F equals electron charge velocity and class B. Basically, they follow the left land row, uh, F, V, and B in perpendicular to each other in three different directions. So when we design the lens, we have to keep this in mind. Electron actually does not travel in the straight line, but this travel inside the microscope like a spiral. Uh, so this is, a, a, you can build magnetic lens, um, a bunch of coils of those uh, wire I just mentioned, and then you open a small gap here the field is concentrated, right? And so by changing the current here, you can change the field. That's what you do to ma manipulate the sun, uh, electron beams. And like uh, uh, the one of the uh, later image showing by uh, Glenn, I see that you can make the electron beam size small and big. So that means you can play the lens like this and make electron beam focus um, higher or lower that changes the final landing beam size of your, of your sample. When you play with this, you can make um, the different trajectory of the field and of the force. Uh, during my graduate study, I actually uh, studied the electron optics, try to design those lenses as well. One of the reasons is when we do something, we try to ask the data from Philips, see what's the distance between different pulpits they never gave to us. So you have to somehow find a way to calculate that. Turn on one lens and then turn on another one and turn on both from the trajectory. You, you try to estimate that. And so, so that's uh, what we uh, know. And also, how can we calculate the power of, of the magnetic field, right? Not like optical microscope. Uh, we have a standard formula, geometric uh, formula. But for an electron magnetic field, and we also have a focal lens that represents the power of the lens. So it's a follow this formula here. And also the electron will rotate, right? We are rotate. And what's the rotation angle of that? We also can be calculated. People say, well, if the electron travel inside the microscope, not on the street line, but on the spiral way, how can you use terminology of geometrical optics, right? light optics. Actually, uh, we can do that because we can use a plan and uh, keep changing the angle, follow this rule, but within this plan, electrons still travel as a straight line, right? So you rotate, but the electron travel inside this plan, always a straight line. If you combine them, it's a spiral, right? So that's the way people deal with electron optics, still can utilize a lot of theory and develop in the optics. Here's a, a cross-section diagram of transmission electron microscope. Again, electron gun on the top, this acceleration coil, you can add a different uh, voltage. You can extract electron from your gun, have a few kilovolt, and then you can extract them um, normally for transmission microscope nowadays, um, you use 100 kilovolt, 200 kilovolt, um, 300 kilovolt. All the days people even actually this to one million volt. There are a few, this kind of microscope around the world uh, in 1980s, 1990s, because the higher the voltage, the shorter the electron wavelengths. They will think will give you better resolution, but the payoff is uh, the drawback is too big, right? It costs you too much, and the scope costs you $50 million a piece. And then to maintain it, you need a three-story tall building and lab to hold it. So it didn't work out. And so that's why only national lab like Argonne and uh, a Berkeley lab have one. Uh, in Japan, they have one, but didn't last too long. Uh, that's a story later. So we look at this cross-section of that, and what is the most important piece? And uh, I said, will be objective lens here. That's where you put the sample in, right? It's a twin lens above and below. So the quality of this pole piece determines the final resolution of your microscope. 
If you say, my microscope has a resolution of two angstroms, if this piece is not good, you might get 2.3, right? So the quality of this is very, very uh, crucial. This is the pole piece. And in that area, um, I mentioned earlier, it's very complicated, right? So this is a pole piece area. You can see how many things we want to put in, all engineered, very, very nicely, precisely. Uh, that's why only a few companies uh, can survive in this business um, to produce such a microscope. Um, it, it just costs too much, yeah. but it's so important to have that. Actually, when you have the sample, uh, you probably already see that three millimeter disc, right? You put your graphene sheet, and then you mount it on this uh, um, uh, TM holder. You slide this in uh, from uh, here all the way to the microscope, right? And the sample actually like this. This sample should have a flexibility. You can tilt alpha and beta, alpha angle tilt, beta tilt, you can move X, Y, Z, right? Uh, all the time, you also have the capability of rotating your sample. Nowadays, nobody, nobody uses that because all those fiber axes already uh, cover that, right? And uh, here is a, a red diagram. I think it would be nice uh, for us to, um, to understand. Uh, for transmission electron microscope, we always heard you have an imaging mode, you have a diffraction mode. Right? So what's the difference? Inside one microscope, why you get two types of different pictures? So from this diagram, we actually can um, understand this uh, with a very clear picture. So here is a sample, right? Here's a sample, gun from the top, goes through the lens and with a parallel beam shining on the sample and then electron beam transmitted through and goes through the aperture final landed on our image plan. So we magnify the area we are seeing inside the microscope uh, to, get, to give the final image here. So that's because of this, uh, we normally say PEM imaging mode give, the, give you the information about the sample location, where, which feature is coming from, right? Sample location. How about the diffraction mode? I highlight this red diagram with this red color here. So if you look at it very careful, this red color really means quite a bit, right? You have beam coming from the sample, you go through three different beams, same as transmission mode. You have a transmitted beam, you have banded to the left, banded to the right, that's diffraction, right? But if you follow the trees of this red line, you will see doesn't matter where this line coming from, left or right, eventually they landed at one point, right? So they all coming from the sample, as long as they escape from the sample in the same direction, they will be landed at the same point. So that's why this is a diffraction, because in the diffraction pattern, we see that tiny shining spot, each spot, represent a set of lattice plan here. If the lattice plan bend your electrons in a different way, follow the Bragg law. So that's why we say diffraction mode give us the direction, direction information of your sample, of your crystal. So normally we combine both to get maxim, to maximize information about our sample. So here's a, a example here, right? If you look at the picture on the left, you first view, you see a bunch of dots here. That's a lattice, that's an atom column. But you hard to see the difference between that, although you feel like something different, right? Something different from top to bottom. But if you do the diffraction, and uh, by changing the operation mode in the diffraction mode, you will see the small red disk here gives us this pattern. The red circle on the bottom here gives us this pattern. This pattern and this pattern are different. If you collect the same diffraction from interface, top and the bottom around this line, you will have 
double set of spots. So that means in this region, you covered this orientation and also this orientation. So that's why you see the twin plane, each spot split into two, right? And so that's a power of imaging and the diffraction and can provide your info, info, uh, crystal information. But if you say, well, nowadays, I really don't want to do both. Can we do one, get the information I want? Yes, you can. Because from the image here, you can just do the simple Fourier transform that provide, uh, provide the same diffraction pattern you have here, right? So in people doing imaging analysis, normally they do that. And because of that, you do the free transform of this, you get this. And then you can artificially remove some spot and inverse free transform, you get another set of lattice image, which is very clean, get rid of a lot, lot of noise. That's why sometimes people do this to highlight the line defects and the defects appear in your crystal. Um, so that's too much, uh, pretty, uh, I want to cover uh, for transmission electron microscope, but only for the first half. So what is the second stage of transmission electron microscope? Uh, people uh, contribute for this development, uh, got a couple of uh, a very huge price already in Europe. And uh, people predict probably in the near future, uh, somebody uh, can get a Nobel Prize because this is a revolutionized transmission electron microscope. Let me try to uh, explain why this is so significant. We know that for the optical microscope, um, the light we use has a wavelength around from two, 20, uh, 200 nanometer to about 700 nanometer, right? So the best optical microscope nowadays can provide something resolution around 200 nanometer. 0.2 microns. So the wavelength and the resolution is compatible. But for transmission electron microscope, let's take a look. If I have 100 kilovolt electrons, move very, very fast. What is the wavelength of that? It's about 0.03, seven angstrom. You have 200 kilovolt, that's 0.025 angstrom, right? And what's the resolution we can achieve? It's about three angstroms. That's probably still the best 20 years ago. Why is there 100 times difference between the wavelength and the resolution? Because of the aberration. So you can see from here, right? Calculate resolution of transmission electron microscope and basically two factors. One is the wavelength, the other is the CS. CS is called spherical aberration coefficient, determined by the property of your lens, the material you use, and how homogeneity of magnetic field, how big the field is, and so on and so forth. So in this case, how can we improve this, right? Instead of finding the third gate, like Ernst Ruska mentioned, and we just improve our gate, make the second gate a little bit wider, right? And so that is a question bothers people for a long, long time, right? Until about 20 some years ago, um, uh, one guy from the uh, United States, um, two guys from uh, uh, Germany, they independently work on this and they make a breakthrough. So in that case, uh, let's see. The resolution and the aberration, right? So here is uh, the formula, CS. If we make the CS as small as possible, then we can improve the resolution. How can we improve the CS and uh, reduce the spherical aberration? We use idea from optical microscope. So that's all connected, right? Once you know something, make sure and expand that knowledge. Um, you can see something very surprised. So what is a spherical aberration? We're all familiar with that. When the light goes through the lens, this is a convex lens, and from the middle, from the edge, the bending power of this is different. So if we have a parallel beam coming, they cannot be focused at one point, but they focus 
in the area. That is aberration. We call it aberration, spherical aberration, right? How can we correct that? People already know that if we add another set of lens, concave lens, just bend it opposite, uh, opposite direction, then you can improve this problem. So that is an inspiration by, uh, for those three people. They said, okay, can we make different magnetic field, pole piece, cover the similar thing as concave lens for optical microscope, right? And of course, in that case, we have to use this force, right? Lorentz force, not the lens, not the glass. So this is a, a corrected, not corrected, right? For optical microscope. So people say, ha ha, we can do the same thing, right? We just add extra set of the lens. And uh, if spots is perfect and is bended one way, then we add another lens bending opposite way. So eventually they will be symmetric. So that's why people say quadruple pole piece is not enough, we build a hexapole. If hexapole is not enough, we build octopole. And eventually we can make this as small as possible. And the way we can do that nowadays is good we can utilize a computer, right? To monitor uh, the dis distortion of this, then we add the field. So you can see here, and this is a non-cracked TM. This is quite a TM. And this is a pole piece people uh, can build. So that's why nowadays all the CS cracked TM are very tall, right? And each time you insert this corrections, you make it taller and taller. Yeah. So we can see uh, this is one of the old microscope I mentioned at the beginning. Uh, after you put the uh, CS corrector there, you can see the improvement of the image right away. 100 kilovolt, you look at the silicon 110 direction, and actually there are two atoms here. You cannot distinguish them. You don't have a resolution. But after CS crack, you can see here, new field open to us. And also, um, Jim mentioned about graphene, right? So here's a, a good example, single sheet graphene. And on the uh, curve edge here, we have a bundle of gold atoms make a bridge here. So you, you can see here with such a beautiful resolution. And this is a carbon graphene. This is a gold uh, atom bridge. And if you measure um, the intensity of this, you will find the species different, right? between gold and uh, uh, graphene. This is just beautifully done and showing uh, the power of the microscope. So here's another one, and Jim mentioned um, many of uh, you here uh, is in the fabrication uh, area. So this is a, a quantum cascade laser device, and we did here at Princeton. Uh, of course, we use a focus ion beam system to prepare this cross-section sample, and the image uh, using our high-end Titan microscope. Uh, each layer is only one or two uh, nanometer, and you can see the imaging, a uh, fully transform of this imaging showing diffraction pattern, right? And then you can do the chemical analysis. Uh, actually, that's something we don't have time to see. Inside the transmission electron microscope, we can put the X-ray detector there and to detect the X-ray coming from the area we image and tell us what kind of elements there. You can see this material is an aluminum indium arsenate and indium gallium arsenate. So you can see the distinguish them very nicely. This is the last picture I want to share with you. This is a recent paper we just published and showing uh, power of transmission electron microscope uh, combined with structural modeling you can see the defect grow on the interface uh, of, of this material, right? This is a, a solar cell uh, material. You can see the interface, there are small disks there. And no other way we can detect this. At low magnification, we can see those lines of the layer. Um, but if we zoom in, we actually can see the defect of those layers. 
Actually, the layer has an uh, inclined boundary, indicate this uh, disk is not a complete layer, right? And using chemical analysis, you can see the duplication uh, of certain elements within this interface, right? So the different color indicated, red is a copper, green is a indium, blue is a, a sulfur. So you can see within this interface, there's a lacking of elements and through the diffusion process. So all those information is very, very critical uh, to understand the property of the solar cell, how the electron transport uh, within such a precise device. I think with that, uh, I can stop here. We're, we're so grateful for, for Dr. Yao for, uh, for, for being here and, and sharing um, many of the wonderful things that, that he's been a part of in uh, transmission electron microscopy, as well as uh, a lot of the operational principles 